All right, so today on this edition of Fitness Facts, let's talk about fat, what it is, how it's stored, how it's burned. Obviously there on, your, on, the, on the screen you can see Fat Bastard, <laughs> who appeared in the second and third uh, Austin Powers movies. And uh, I remember he worked underneath uh, Dr. Evil, and they were trying to take out Austin Powers in that movie. Uh, but the reason I put him on here is um, he had a very kind of profound statement in that movie where he said, I eat because I'm unhappy, and I'm unhappy because I eat. So the reason I say that that was a profound statement is a lot of people that are struggling with their weight, that's part of the problem, right? They're not happy. They use food to comfort themselves, and then they feel guilty about you know how much they ate or what they ate. So you know a lot of times, um, you know when I was a personal trainer, strength coach working in the field outside of academia, um, I would hear trainers say to a client, you know, well, you just need to move more and eat less, right? So, you know, calories in, calories out. You need to expend more calories than you consume. Well, yeah, that's all true. And that's if you consume less calories than what, um, yeah, if you consume less calories than uh, your total daily energy expenditure, then you're going to lose weight. But the problem is, is there's a psychological component too. So that's why I had, you know, fat bastard here on the screen. Um, so we'll go ahead and get into this topic today. All right, so an overview, where are we going? So what is fat? Um, really, it's can be, you know, broken down into three different groups or types of fat. So we have phospholipids, sterols, and triglycerides. And by the way, the picture there, another great movie. If you haven't seen it, I think it's from the early 2000s. Watch Dodgeball. It's a great movie um, if you like stupid humor. All right. So back on track. What else are we talking about? Lipoproteins. Okay, what are those? We're going to talk about how they're important in transporting fats in the blood. Okay, these are like boats that transport cargo, okay, in the bloodstream. Uh, the cargo being these different types of fat. Uh, so we'll, again, get into transport of fat, how fat is stored, and also how it's burned. All right, so just to define what fat is, uh, it's also referred to as a lipid. And a lipid, again, is a family of compounds that includes phospholipids, sterols, and triglycerides. Now, triglycerides are the main, the primary form of fat that's stored within our body. Okay, so when, you, when, when I talk about fat storage and fat burning, you should think, you know, triglyceride, okay? So triglycerides are found in, um, you know, a saturated form in the fat that's in, you know, say on a ribeye steak, that marbling, there's triglyceride in there. Um, you find it in butter, you know, saturated fats tend to be solid at room temperature. You also find triglycerides in oils. Right, so these are your monounsaturated and polyunsaturated fats that are in things like olive oil, canola oil, peanut oil, vegetable oils. Okay, so they can exist in you know a solid or liquid form. Um, lipids are characterized by their insolubility in water, and so you, you should intuitively know this if you think about um, if you have a glass of water sitting here and you pour in some olive oil, they don't mix, right? And that's because the Oil is hydrophobic. It's what we would call water fearing. It's repelling water away from it. And the reason I bring that up and it's important is because you have to remember that the bloodstream is, is a watery environment. There's plasma in there. And how are we going to transport lipids in this watery environment? And that's where you'll see when I get into talking about lipoproteins, they're important for fat transport, right? We just can't have fat floating through the bloodstream, it's not effective. We've got to have it on a boat, which is a lipoprotein. That boat carries the cargo, the fat, through the bloodstream, okay? So um, what is what are fats composed of? Well, the atoms carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, okay? Carbohydrates are also composed of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Um, amino acids or proteins, they're, they're a little different. They have those same three atoms, but they also have nitrogen, okay? And, you know, fat's often demonized, but it's necessary for normal body function. And we're going to get into that um, here on these, these coming slides. 
So again, this first type of fat, phospholipid, just looking at its structure here, you can see that a phospholipid has what's called a hydrophilic head. There, that large red circle. So a hydrophilic head is usually composed of a phosphate group and then some sort of water-loving. Hydrophilic means water-loving molecule like maybe choline that's attached to the phosphate. Then you have a glycerol in the middle there that links that hydrophilic head to a hydrophobic tail. So the tails there, those two yellow tails that have the zigzag line, those represent two different fatty acids that are attached to the head, okay? And so you're probably thinking, well, hydrophobic, hydrophilic, you know, what's the point? Why does that matter? Well, the hydrophilic head, these are often used, these phospholipids, they're, they're a component of our cell membranes. They're very important. We have to have phospholipid in our body uh, to form the cell membranes for all our cells. So the hydrophilic heads face out towards the watery environment on the extracellular side, outside of the cell. And then we also have another layer um, where hydrophilic heads face in towards the cytoplasm. And then the hydrophobic heads face away from the watery cytoplasm because they're water-fearing and away from the extracellular fluid. Okay, so we're going to see this here on the next slide. So here's an example of how these phospholipids comprise a cell membrane, right? So all of our cells, right, they have this cell membrane inside their cytoplasm. Outside of the cell membrane, that's the extracellular space. There's interstitial fluid. All right, so we have a watery environment outside the cell and a watery environment inside the cell. And you see the phospholipids in this picture. Um, their heads are yellow, the hydrophilic head. And then you see those two fatty acid tails, those hydrophilic tails. And notice that in this cell membrane, it's comprised of what's called a phospholipid bilayer. So those hydrophobic tails orient themselves towards each other while the water-loving hydrophilic heads face out, okay? And we also see some other molecules in this membrane. There's some cholesterol there that you see those ring-like structures, four rings that are in red. Um, that helps maintain some fluidity um, within the cell. Because you gotta remember, if you look at a textbook and, and you, know, you see a cell, a lot of times it's easy to think of it as a 2D structure, but these cells are three-dimensional, right? And the membrane has to be kind of flexible and fluid, and cholesterol helps with that. So again, we always think of cholesterol as, oh, it's bad. No, we actually need it for a variety of functions we're going to get into, one of which you can see it's a component of our cell membranes, along with all these phospholipids that form that bilayer. There's also, in purple, some different channels. Pro these are comprised of proteins. So some of these transport, you know, things like amino acids into the cell. Um, some of them are used uh, as receptors for hormones. Uh, so again, all of those things that you, some of them are enzymes that are embedded in the membrane that help to create or catalyze chemical reactions. So those, all those purple um, things that you see in the membrane, they have a variety of, of different functions and they're, they're comprised of of protein. So, all right, so what are the functions in the human body of phospholipids? Yeah, kind of got into it. They're a primary constituent of cell membranes. Um, they help fat soluble substances like vitamins and certain hormones pass easily into across the cell membrane and into the cell and also back out. So, you know, there's certain fat soluble vitamins like vitamin A, D, E, and K that you know are able to pass through um, those phospholipid membranes and also certain hormones this the steroid hormones they're nonpolar they can easily diffuse across that membrane whereas you know polar molecules are going to need those transport protein channels to get into the cell but um, certain hormones testosterone uh, estradiol uh, cortisol these are what are called nonpolar and they can just diffuse right across that phospholipid bilayer, okay? Um, phospholipids also act as emulsifiers to keep fats suspended in the blood and body. So again, kind of important here in, in fat transport. All right, so sterols. Let's talk about this type of lipid or fat. And there's a huge word there, tongue twister, and if you could use more than a 
seven letters at a time in Scrabble. This would be a great Scrabble word, but it's perhydrocyclopentanophenanthrene. <laughs> that is the ring-like structure that you see on the screen of this cholesterol molecule. And it's also found in these other steroid hormones because many of these steroid hormones are derived from cholesterol. So you see that molecule at the top that has the ABCD ring-like structure, that is cholesterol, okay? So again, it's comprised of a bunch of carbon, hydrogen, some oxygen, but you see that same ring-like structure in a bunch of these other steroid hormones that are listed on the screen. So like pregnenolone, which is a precursor to progesterone, um, you see androgens like androsterone and testosterone, estrogens, estradiol, estriol, estrone. These are all formed from cholesterol. So you can see how, again, like I mentioned, it's, it's often thought of as this bad thing, but we have to have it in adequate amounts in our body because it's a component of cell membranes. It's, it's used to make uh, these different hormones. Um, a derivative of cholesterol there, 7-dehydrocholesterol, that's actually found in your skin. And so when UV light, specifically UVB radiation, hits your skin, there's a reaction that occurs with that light and the 7-dehydrocholesterol where you create cholecalciferol. That's an inactive form of vitamin D. That inactive form of vitamin D, cholecalciferol, has to then travel to the liver where it gets hydroxylated, so it gets a little OH group tagged onto it. Then it travels from the liver to the kidney, gets another hydroxyl, hydroxyl group attached to it. And that's where in the kidney it's finally your active form of vitamin D. So again, this is why you know we talk about synthesizing vitamin D, get your sunlight, that's important. That vitamin D actually is synthesized in the skin from cholesterol, okay? Um, cholesterol is also a component, if you look on the right side there, um, uh, seven hydroxycholesterol is, can be used in making bile acids, and we need these different bile acids to help with fat digestion um, in the small intestine. So breaking down fat along with, we also have some enzymes like pancreatic lipase that assist with fat digestion and absorption. So again, a lot of functions here um, with, with cholesterol. Um, so it's just important to note those that, you know, it's not always um, a bad thing. So yeah, every cell in the human body can manufacture cholesterol. Uh, cholesterol synthesis is a complex 37-step process. If you take my exercise biochem class, we talk about that in there. Um, what is the starting molecule that's used to make cholesterol? Well, that's you use two molecules of what's called acetyl coenzyme A. And then it follows this pathway through 37 steps that's, that's called the mevelinate pathway. All right. Now, what's interesting is a lot of people think that most of the cholesterol in their bloodstream and in circulation is from their diet, right? Actually, about 80% of the cholesterol that's in your blood is produced by the liver. So that's called endogenous production, right? The liver produces a, a lot of cholesterol because sometimes the other peripheral cells, you know, like I said, every cell can produce it but they don't make enough so the liver can ship out what it synthesizes to say the testes or the ovaries, right? The testes to make testosterone or the ovaries to make um, estri estradiol or progesterone, right? Those sex hormones, right? So the liver can supply cholesterol to different glands, different parts of the body, um, and then you can produce again steroid hormones from it. It can be incorporated into a cell membrane. A lot of different things. So functions here in the human body. Again, I've mentioned some of these synthesis of vitamin D, hormone production, precursor to form bile acids. And again, cholesterol helps maintain fluidity, fluidity in the cell membrane. Okay, And look at how similar on the right side there, the different steroid hormones look to cholesterol, right? They all have that ABCD ring structure. Um, they're all very similar. Now, there may be differences in where the OH hydroxyl group is and, and where carbon atoms are and where carbonyl groups are. But in general, structures are they're very similar, right? 
of the of those uh, sex hormones and those um, you know also we have aldosterone and cortisol so other hormones as well all right so now let's talk about sterols and food so foods derived from both plants and animals contain sterols uh, typically if they come from plants we call them phytosterols only those from animals contain significant amounts of cholesterol so you think things like you know animal products meat eggs seafood poultry and dairy products now there's a lot of confusion that exists about dietary cholesterol and our blood cholesterol. Okay, so people a lot of times will ask, or even students, you know, well, well, what foods contain the good cholesterol? Well, there's no really good cholesterol per se. There's just cholesterol, right? Um, so it, it's not a special type that's found in you know one food versus another. Okay, so when you hear good versus bad, or maybe you go to your physician and they say, oh, your bad cholesterol is higher, you're good. What are they referring to? Well, good versus bad refers to the type of boat, the lipoprotein, that the cholesterol is transported in in the blood, okay? And we'll talk more about that, but we'll get into triglycerides now. So triglyceride, what is that made of? Well, tri means three, like a tricycle has three wheels. A triglyceride molecule has three fatty acids attached, and you see those in purple there. Three, each one of those uh, kind of purple zigzag lines is a fatty acid, and they're attached to the green molecule, which is glycerol. Okay, so three fatty acids and one glycerol molecule make a triglyceride. All right, now, fatty acids can be saturated or unsaturated. All right, if a fatty acid is saturated, that means the structure has the maximum number of hydrogens bonded to each carbon atom, okay? So again, these fatty acids, it's just a long chain of carbon in that zigzag structure with hydrogen around it. And if each one of those carbons is fully saturated with hydrogen, then it's a saturated fatty acid. Now, if you look at the unsaturated fatty acids, you'll notice they have this double bond between carbon groups, okay? If there's one double bond, we call it monounsaturated fatty acid. If there's more than one, it's a polyunsaturated fatty acid. And these are the types of fatty acids you tend to find in various oils, like olive oil is high in monounsaturated fatty acids, right? So again, polyunsaturated fatty acids are found in, in different vegetable oils. So that's just the meaning behind saturation and unsaturation okay now what are the functions of triglycerides well they're the major storage form of lipid in the body and in the diet so in our adipocytes right our fat cells which you can see there on the screen are kind of clear and they have this big chunk of yellow triglyceride it's a triglyceride pool so we store triglyceride in our adipocytes. We can also store some triglyceride intramuscularly, so within our muscle, um, but it's healthy to have it stored in your fat cells. What we don't want is triglyceride getting stored ectopically, like in and around our abdominal organs, in and around the liver, things like that, right? So our fat cells are the container where triglyceride should be stored, but in certain conditions, you know, obesity, diabetes, you start to see fat getting stored ectopically, which is not healthy because it's inside the abdominal cavity in and around the organs, okay? We want it stored in the fat cells, not, on, not in and around the organs. So stored fat provides about 60% of the body's resting energy needs, right? So it's a great source of energy that we can utilize, for instance, uh, during long duration uh, exercise. It provides fuel to kind of go the distance, so to say. Uh, we need it for insulation and protection, right? So again, having some body fat helps to keep us warm. It also provides protection for our uh, internal organs. Uh, it's a carrier of fat-soluble compounds. Remember, some vitamins need to be carried um, that are fat-soluble within fat, so vitamins A, D, E, and K. Um, vitamins B and C are water-soluble. Um, the flavor and feel of food, right? It tastes good if you have some fat in your food. It, it makes it taste delicious, right? So think of, again of like a, a hamburger or a steak. Also, um, if you have some fat in your meal, it can slow gastric emptying, so it can slow the rate at which the stomach empties food. 
which can help promote some satiety. It's definitely doesn't promote satiety or feeling satisfied as much as like protein does. But um, once triglycerides hit the small intestine, there's some hormones that are released that signal the brain that, okay, you can stop eating and you're full now. But So it has a bit of a satiety effect. Not as strong as protein though. All right, so lipids are not soluble in body fluids or the bloodstream like I mentioned, all right? So again, think of these lipids as cargo. They need to get on a boat so they can be safely carried and they can kind of mix within that watery environment of the bloodstream. So what type of boat do they travel on? Well, that's what's called a lipoprotein, all right? So lipids must combine with proteins. That There's other proteins that surround a lipoprotein called apolipoproteins. And having these apolipoproteins on that outside of this boat allows it to kind of integrate or, or you know, flow within the, within the bloodstream without, um, you know, any uh, uh, problems being transported or traveling through the, through the bloodstream. So again, lipoproteins, they're spherical macromolecules that are composed of these apolipoproteins that are on the outer surface of the, of the boat, if you will. There's also phospholipids, triglycerides, and cholesterol that compose these lipoproteins. So really you can see these, these boats, these lipoproteins, they're lipid transporters. And there's actually four classes of them, all right? So we have chylomicrons. We have what are called very low-density lipoproteins, VLDL. Low-density lipoprotein is LDL. And high-density lipoprotein is HDL. Now let's just look at the structure of these lipoproteins, just like we looked at the structure of a triglyceride and, and sterols. So again, you see some phospholipids, right, that have those hydrophilic heads and hydrophobic tails on the outer kind of portion of this spherical molecule. You also see that these boats have apolipoproteins, kind of the green ovals. That kind of allows it to interact um, and, and flow smoothly through the bloodstream, if you will. Then there's some cholesterol in there, cholesterol esters, triglyceride. Now, different lipoproteins carry different proportions of these fats, all right? So you typically hear HDL, high-density lipoprotein. Um, you know, why is it called high-density lipoprotein? Because about half of it is protein. You see half of that circle is purple. So HDL, that type of boat, that carrier, half of it's full of protein. Protein has a heavier molecular weight than uh, cholesterol, triglyceride, and phospholipids. They're not as dense. And so that's why it's called high-density lipoprotein, because there's more protein. It makes it more dense than, say, LDL molecule, which is referred to as low-density lipoprotein. You can see an LDL... There's a much higher percentage there of cholesterol, less protein carried in LDL. You got some triglyceride and phospholipid in there as well. Now, why is one called good and one called bad cholesterol? Um, again, it's because of the direction that they flow in the bloodstream. So high-density lipoproteins are the boats that tend to take cholesterol from the periphery, like from the peripheral blood vessels and the peripheral cells back to the liver where that cholesterol can be metabolized. So you can kind of think of them as like street sweepers, right? Meaning, or, or, or cleaners in the river, right? They're cleaning up the river, transporting cholesterol back to the liver. The LDL form, um, this is formed in the bloodstream, and this is what they have found um, in atherosclerosis in the atheromas, the fatty plaques that form in blood vessels, is LDL. Now, just because you have high LDL in the blood doesn't necessarily mean you have atherosclerosis. In fact, some people may have high LDL and, you know, they get a coronary artery calcium scan done. You know, they have clean coronary arteries. They have clean blood vessels. Um, so other people, they may have low LDL, but they have some fatty plaques that have developed. They have some atherosclerosis occurring but their LDL is low. So it's like, well, how can that be? Because there's other factors that contribute to atherosclerosis, right? 
the development of fatty plaques in your blood vessels. Things like high blood sugar, things like um, smoking, things like high blood pressure. Um, these various factors can all damage what's called the endothelial lining, which is the inner lining of your blood vessels. And it's when those endothelial cells become damaged that LDL particles, these little boats that carry, that are called bad cholesterol, those LDL molecules can get through kind of the cracks in the blood vessel wall. Then they get into what's called the subintimal space, which is behind the endothelial cells, where they can undergo what's called oxidation. Then you start to have white blood cells infiltrate. Those white blood cells release inflammatory cytokines. Then your body kind of tries to wall off that area. You may form a, um, a clot and kind of a, a coat over it. And that starts to form a plaque, and you may get some calcification in there, and this is what narrows the, um, the vessel and can impede blood flow. But again, I, I think, and I'm kind of going on a tangent here, but a lot of times physicians will look and they'll just say, oh, your LDL is high, you need to be on a statin right now. And in my view, it's like you, I wish more physicians, and um, I talk to my students about this because some of them will become physicians one day, and I'm like, please, when you become a physician, don't just treat a number. Look at the patient holistically. Like, if their LDL is high, okay, that might be something to watch. But if they're in good shape, and, and some of this is genetically controlled, right? How much, the, how much cholesterol the liver produces. So most of, most of the cholesterol, again, in your bloodstream is not from your diet. So there's a genetic component here, too. But let's say their LDL is high, and they also have, um, you know, they're also very active. They don't smoke. Their, their blood pressure's low, their blood sugar's good. Well, those risk factors are low, but we're just picking out one here, right? Now, it's more of a worry. Yeah, if you have high LDL cholesterol and you're diabetic, you've got high blood sugar, um, you have high blood pressure, you're a smoker, you're sedentary, now you've got a lot of risk factors there where it's more likely that, yeah, you could have some damage to your blood vessels. So um, I think it's important to look at all these factors that contribute to damage to the blood vessel, right? And, and not just demonize LDL, this transporter of cholesterol as this bad molecule. Because again, as, as we've talked about, you can see that cholesterol has a variety of important functions in the body, okay? And um, it's just, just something, food for thought, okay? Now let's look at these different boats, right? That are circulating in the blood, a chylomicron. What's the percentage of triglyceride, cholesterol, phospholipid, protein? So these different cargos, what's the percentage of each of these transported in a chylomicron? Well, primarily triglyceride, about 85% of the cargo that's in that boat, that carrier, is triglyceride. You see a little bit of cholesterol, a little bit of phospholipid, a little bit of protein. So each of these boats has a particular function, right? That's why they're carrying different amounts of cargos here. VLDL, you see it has less triglyceride, it's about half, then you've got more cholesterol in VLD, VLDL, phospholipid and protein. IDL, that's not in the blood circulation for very long because IDL is kind of an intermediate between the VLDL and LDL. So VLDL gets converted to IDL in the blood and then L, IDL gets converted to LDL. So you see through various enzymes. LDL contains quite a bit of cholesterol, right? Um, and some phospholipid, a little bit of protein, not near as much tri triglyceride as like a, a chylomicron, right? And remember, it is important to, to monitor LDL cholesterol levels because those tend to get in those atheromas, those plaques, but just because your LDL may be a little high doesn't mean you have atherosclerosis, right? There's other factors at play there. HDL, this is the one we typically think of, this boat or this carrier as being, you know, the good cholesterol because, again, it's a higher weight, it does carry cholesterol in it, but it tends to carry it away from the blood vessels in the periphery back to the liver to be broken down. This slide shows the direction and how these different boats, these different lipoproteins move. Okay, so let's say you consume some dietary fat, and you can see that's going to enter from your stomach into your small intestine, right, where that blue arrow is, kind of the top left of the, the slide. So... I'll use the example, my daughter loves Five Guys, right? Five Guys Burgers. So you're obviously getting some protein in that meat and some fat. So let's say the fat from that burger, right, it's going to start to be digested, you know, in the stomach. 
It's going to be released into the upper part of the small intestine called the duodenum. And then in response to that fat entering the duodenum, your pancreas is going to release an enzyme called pancreatic lipase. Uh, liver and gallbladder, they can also release bile. Those bile acids are going to help break down the fat into smaller molecules or components called mycelles. And together, the bile acids and pancreatic lipase will start to break apart these large triglyceride molecules. Remember, a triglyceride is composed of a glycerol and three fatty acids. It's going to start to break those apart into individual fatty acids and mono, uh, uh, monoglycerides, which is just a glycerol and one fatty acid. So it's breaking down into smaller parts. Once you've got those smaller parts, the fatty acids, the monoglyceride formed, they're going to enter into what are called enterocytes. These are cells that line the small intestine. Inside the small intestinal wall, you form chylomicrons. There you see next to number one. Those chylomicrons carry the fatty acids that are coming in from the lumen of the um, small intestine. They're going to take all those fatty acids that are coming in, they're going to take the glycerol, and they're going to repackage the fatty acids and glycerol back together to form triglyceride, okay? And on the previous slide, you saw chylomicrons, about 85% of what's packaged in that boat is triglyceride, right? They're packaging it from the gastrointestinal tract here, from the small intestine. So then those chylomicrons transport those triglycerides into the lymphatic system, so through lymph ducts into the lymph, uh, lymphatic system. Those chylomicrons then are carried through the lymphatic system. They eventually get dumped into the bloodstream near the, the subclavian vein underneath the um, clavicle. Chylomicrons then enter the blood, and they're carried throughout the bloodstream until they reach an enzyme called lipoprotein lipase. You see that in red there. That enzyme lipoprotein lipase converts, kind of breaks apart the triglyceride that's inside the chylomicron into fatty acids and glycerol, okay? Then those fatty acids and glycerol molecules are free to diffuse into the body's cells. So they can move into adipocytes, fat cells, where then they could be converted and stored as triglyceride, as fat. They could also enter muscle cells, right? So fatty acids could be uptaken by a muscle cell and used as a fuel source to produce energy, which is in the form of ATP. Um, so again, glycerol may end up going to the liver where we can actually make glucose out of glycerol. So again, that lipoprotein lipase that's along kind of the uh, lining of your blood vessels helps break apart that stored triglyceride in those chylomicrons. Then after the chylomicron releases it's triglyceride to the body cells. What we have left, if you go to step number two, is a chylomicron remnant. Okay, so this little remnant just returns to the liver and gets disassembled. Now we go to step three. So VLDL. Remember, this is a boat, a lipoprotein carrier that the liver produces. Okay, and so the liver is going to release VLDL. Okay, and that's going to bring more triglyceride, you know, cholesterol to the body cells. Again, VLDL, once it's released from the liver, is going to travel in the bloodstream. When it bumps into that enzyme, lipoprotein lipase again, the triglycerides are going to be released as fatty acid and glycerol to be uptaken by our body cells. And then in the cells, like a fat cell, they can be stored as triglyceride, as fat. We've got a reserve en energy uh, uh, storage there. They can be uptaken by muscle cells again, for example. Now, when the lipoprotein lipase acts on the VLDL molecule, that converts the VLDL into what's called IDL. That's intermediate density lipoprotein. Okay. Now, this doesn't stay in the blood for very long, and it gets converted pretty quickly into LDL, which is low density lipoprotein. And you notice how this is a smaller particle. Okay. LDL then uh, can deliver cholesterol to our cells, which again, we cholesterol has functions in our cells that we talked about. And it is true that it can be a risk factor for atherosclerosis and cardiovascular disease if it's elevated. But it's not just the concentration of LDL you have in your blood that's uh, a risk factor for 
atherosclerosis, blood vessel damage, cardiovascular disease. It's also the particle number and the particle size, which isn't talked about a lot. So LDL particles can be large, kind of fluffy where they kind of float along through the bloodstream and they don't tend to get lodged in the wall of the blood vessel, or they can be smaller and dense. And typically, if you have a lot of the small, dense LDL particles, you also have, you, you also, or I'm sorry, if you have more, if you have small, dense LDL particles, you tend to have a lot of them. And if you have a lot of small, dense LDL particles, some research indicates those are the kind that are more likely to um, be lodged in your blood vessel walls. And interestingly, you know, if you look at a typical Western diet, what's our Western diet high in? It's high in carbs and high in fat. And that typical Western diet tends to drive um, more of these LDL particles to take on a small dense shape. So we have many, many little small particles in the bloodstream. You can think of them as like grains of sand. And then, you know, grains of sand, if you have some sand in your shoe, it's irritating on your foot, right? Well, these little grains of sand, if you have many of those small, dense LDL particles, are, can also be irritating to the blood vessels too. But again, they're not the only component that's involved in forming an atherosclerotic plaque. Remember, you've got high blood pressure, high blood sh sugar, smoking. Other factors can damage the blood vessel wall as well. Okay, so now on to number six. What is HDL, right? What does this carrier do? All right, so the HDL boat or lipoprotein, it is manufactured by the liver, but it goes around through the, again, think of the bloodstream as a, you know, rivers and creeks, since we're using boats as an analogy here. Well, this boat is going to flow along, and it's going to pick up excess cholesterol from the periphery and transport it back to the liver. So it's involved in what's called reverse cholesterol transport. You see all the other lipoproteins are bringing you know, lipids, cholesterol to the body cells, whereas HDL is bringing it from the cells and the periphery back to the liver. Okay, so that's why it's considered good, because it's kind of cleaning up, right? It's taking all that cholesterol back to the liver to be metabolized. All right, so let's talk about um, caloric surplus and caloric deficit, okay? If you eat more calories than the amount of calories you need to maintain body weight each day, you would be in a caloric surplus. Any extra calories that you eat above whatever the, the number is of calories that you need to consume just to maintain weight, if you eat anything above that, yeah, you store those extra calories as fat through a process called lipogenesis, okay? So you see there I have an arrow pointing to feasting. So when excess energy is consumed, it is stored in adipose tissue as triglyceride. All right? And so again, how does that um, get into, you know, how do, how, do, uh, how do we store that excess energy? Well, that, that enzyme that I talked about, lipoprotein lipase, helps with breaking down the triglycerides, into their component parts, fatty acids and glycerol, from those boats, those carriers in the blood that are carrying um, these lipids. So your VLDL molecules, your chylomicrons, lipoprotein releases fatty acids and glycerol, it enters the, tri it enters the fat cells, the adipose tissue, and then it's stored as triglyceride. If you're in a caloric deficit, so let's say you've figured that the your total daily energy expenditure is 2,200 calories, all right? So you need to eat 2,200 calories just to maintain weight because that's what you're expending each day through activity, exercise, just keeping your organs functioning, etc. And you decide you want to go on a diet, so you eat 250 less calories per day. Now you've created a caloric deficit, right? Okay, because you're eating less than the amount of calories you need to maintain weight. So now your body enters into, you know, lipolysis or fat burning um, stage, if you will. Because you're not eating enough calories to maintain weight, you have to supply energy to your body through the breakdown of fat, right? So then that stored triglyceride that's in the adipose tissue can get released. You release fatty acids. Those fatty acids can circulate in the bloodstream and be uptaken by muscles and other cells. 
And those fatty acids can be oxidized in what are called the mitochondria of our cells. They're like power plants called the powerhouse of the cell. If you remember from like an eighth grade biology class, we can oxidize, break down those fatty acids, chop up, chop off their carbons, and eventually produce ATP, which is the fuel that our cells need to do work. Okay. So, um, and, and interestingly, that enzyme hormone sensitive lipase that releases um, fat and, and from our fat cells, which most people want, right? You want fat burning. It's called hormone sensitive because various hormones affect its function. So, for instance, epinephrine, which is adrenaline, norepinephrine, noradrenaline, those hormones are elevated when you're exercising. What do those hormones do? They stimulate hormone-sensitive lipase in our fat tissue, our adipose tissue, and that's going to cause triglycerides to release fatty acids into the blood, right? So we're releasing fat, and then those fatty acids can be used by our muscle cells and other cells for a fuel, for fuel to make ATP. And then there's, there's other hormones that affect it as well. Um, for instance, insulin works opposite. Insulin will actually inhibit hormone-sensitive lipase so that it cannot break down um, fat and release fatty acids because insulin wants to promote storage, okay? Okay, so there's a lot going on on this slide, but let's try to break it down. Um, so what you see, the big circle that's kind of a beige color, that is an adipocyte, a fat cell, okay? Now inside of the large beige circle, we have kind of a peach, colored circle where you see tag pool, that's where we're storing all this intracellular triglyceride, right, that we've talked about, right? Now, you see a lot of different abbreviations in there, um, in, you know, rectangles and squares and circles and ovals. Um, those are abbreviations for various enzymes and molecules that play a role in either storing fat, which is called lipogenesis, that you see there in that larger pink rectangle, or there's enzymes, molecules that play a role in lipolysis. That's breaking down fat, right? Which is what most people want, right? We want lipolysis. We want to burn fat and break it down and release it out of the fat cell so our muscles can use those fatty acids and burn them for fuel, right? So let's kind of talk about what's happening with lipogenesis first, like how the fat gets stored in this adipocyte. So there you see what kind of look like hot tamales, those little pink <laughs> ovals outside of the, the fat cell, uh, that's actually the bloodstream, right? So those, that's what the uh, boats, right, those different lipoproteins are being carried in. So you see chylomicrons are carrying TG, triglyceride there, in the blood. You see VLDL is carrying triglyceride in the blood, you know, from the, the liver. The chylomicron is primarily carrying the triglyceride that came in uh, through the diet from the, uh, the small intestine, because that's where those chylomicrons are formed. But anyway, they travel in the blood, and then they bump into that LPL. That's lipoprotein lipase. They're in that yellow oval out in the bloodstream. That lipo -lip lipoprotein lipase splits the triglyceride apart. It's going to release some free fatty acid, so that's your FFA, the little zigzag line attached to that purple circle. That free fatty acid then leaves the bloodstream and goes through a CD36 transporter. Okay, so that helps bring the fatty acid into this fat cell. Then you see that fatty acid inside the fat cell, and let's just say we're, you know, we've eaten, overeaten too many calories this day, maybe it's a Friday night, you know, you've had some pizza, too much pizza, you're in this pro-lipogenic state, your insulin level is going to be high after a meal. It's going to promote storage of these fatty acids and uptake, okay? So once that fatty acid is inside the fat cell, what happens? How does it get converted to a triglyceride? Because remember, a triglyceride is three fatty acids and one glycerol. Well, there's an enzyme there called DGAT. So that stands for diglyceride acyltransferase. That enzyme takes the glycerol from G3P, that's glycerol 3-phosphate, which you see below that pink rectangle that says lipogenesis. It's going to take the glycerol from G3P, take the fatty acids that are coming in through that CD36 transporter. It's going to combine three fatty acids with the glycerol from uh, G3P, 
and that enzyme then will allow a tag, a triglyceride, to be formed and stored in that triglyceride pool. So you just follow that dashed line. These are all the molecules, those dashed lines with the arrows. Those are all the different molecules and enzymes involved in forming a triglyceride inside your fat cells. Okay, So you might wonder, well, where is that G3P coming from, glycerol 3-phosphate? Well, after a meal, you know, you ate a pizza, yeah, you're going to have some fat coming into the cell, fatty acids, you're going to have some glucose, right? Pizza has bread, that's a carbohydrate. So you've got some glucose that is coming into the cell through what's called a GLUT4 transporter. Insulin mobilizes these GLUT4 transporters. They come to the cell membrane, and they basically bring that glucose into the cell. So you see those blue molecules there. Um that are inside the, the fat cell. The glucose, once it's in the cell, in this case, because again, it, you know, it's after a meal, you, you've eaten a lot that day, we're kind of in a storage mode now with high insulin. The glucose can get converted to acetyl-CoA. That acetyl-CoA there, then there's a couple enzymes that can act on that. ACC is acetyl-CoA carboxylase. FAS is fatty acid synthase we can actually make fatty acids from that acetyl-CoA. So then you'd have more fatty acids out there in, that, in the uh, cytoplasm of this fat cell to be used to build a triglyceride, right? So again, we can fatty acids are either in, coming into the cell from the bloodstream, or we could create fatty acids from glucose via acetyl-CoA. Um, we also can create that glycerol, glycerol 3-phosphate from glucose, and we use that glycerol in making a triglyceride. So again, a lot going on there, a lot of ways that we can build that triglyceride. Now let's look at the solid lines, the solid arrows. This is like our fat-burning lipolysis pathway, all right? So let's say you've been fasting or you know, maybe to maintain weight, you need to eat, you know, again, 2,200 calories, but you've only eaten 1,600 or 1,800 calories that day. Now you're going to be in a more pro-lipolytic or pro-fat burning state. There's other things that affect this, like being in the cold and shivering, having high levels of catecholamines in the blood, which these would be high during exercise. So things like noradrenaline, uh, which is norepinephrine, things like epinephrine, which is adrenaline, right? You're releasing those hormones from the adrenal gland when you exercise. And what happens is they bind to what's called a beta adrenergic receptor. You see that BAR or beta AR that's on the membrane of the fat cell. And there's a little green oval that says NA. So that NA, that's a hormone, noradrenaline, or it could be epinephrine. You know, this is released during um, exercise. It's going to bind to that beta adrenergic receptor, and once it's bound to the receptor, that stimulates an enzyme. There you see AC in that oval. I'm trying to maybe go in colorblind here, but it looks like kind of red oval. That AC is an enzyme, adenylylcyclase, that converts a molecule of ATP, adenosine triphosphate, into CAMP, cyclic adenosine monophosphate. CAMP then signals PKA, you see there in that pink rectangle. That's protein kinase A. CAMP switches that protein kinase A on. Protein kinase A in is, is an enzy enzyme, a kinase enzyme. What do kinase enzymes do? They phosphorylate other molecules. So they tack a phosphate group onto, in this case, PKA tacks a phosphate onto ATGL and HSL. Okay, So ATGL, when it receives a phosphate group from PKA, what is ATGL? adipocyte triglyceride lipase, okay, or adipose uh, triglyceride lipase. When that is phosphorylated and it receives that phosphate from PKA, it's going to break down a triglyceride molecule, there you see tag, that was stored into a diglyceride. And in that process, right, tri is three, one of the fatty acids is released, and now diglyceride, there's only two fatty acids attached to the glycerol molecule. PKA also phosphorylates that HSL, kind of in that orangish-yellow rectangle. HSL is hormone-sensitive lipase. Remember, we talked about this on the previous slide, and I said it's sensitive to hormone activity. In this case, the hormone 
that it's sensitive to is that noradrenaline, that Na that's bound to the beta adrenergic receptor. But again, other things can increase the activity of hormone-sensitive lipase, which is an important enzyme in breaking down these triglyceride molecules. And you see those factors under that prolipolytic um, box up there. So growth hormone can stimulate hormone-sensitive lipase. It's a lot of times why you know, bodybuilders, in some cases, will abuse or use growth hormone illegally because it will turn on that enzyme and increase fat burning. Okay? Um, cortisol, glucocorticoids, so cortisol can turn on HSL. Um, so there's a variety of things there. I won't go through all of them, but again, it's sensitive and responsive to certain hormones. And when it's active, hormone-sensitive lipase breaks down a diglyceride molecule, which only has two fatty acids, into a MAG, M-A-G, monoglyceride. And in that process, a fatty acid is released. So mono, meaning one, mag, monoglyceride, is just a glycerol with one fatty acid left. Because the HSL and ATGL upstream, they release two fatty acids. We only have one remaining. So the mag, monoglycerol, or monoglyceride, that gets converted by monoglyceride lipase, that MGL in the purple rectangle, to its component parts, which is glycerol, and a free fatty acid. Now that we finally have just glycerol and one fatty acid remaining, those molecules can enter the blood, and they can circulate to other cells that need fuel, right? The glycerol might go to the liver. Our liver can use that glycerol through a pathway, uh, through a pathway, it's called gluconeogenesis, to make glucose or sugar. Um, the fat, free fatty acids could circulate, again, to muscle cells, like I've said, to fuel them like during exercise to produce ATP and energy. So again, there's a lot going on here. Very complex physiology at play here in a fat cell, right? So you've got the lipogenesis is the fat storage side. That's how we store triglyceride. Then you have the lipolysis. That's the breakdown and release of a triglyceride into glycerol and fatty acids back into the blood, okay? All right, so let's look at what happens now when fatty acids are released from that adipocyte, that fat cell, and they enter the blood. How, do they, how are they transported? How do they get to a muscle cell to be used as fuel, right, where they're oxidized and burned? So on this slide, you see the adipocyte labeled there at the top, kind of in yellow. That's the fat cell. Uh, the, the blue kind of oval-shaped structure there in the adipocyte with the three yellow tails, that's a stored triglyceride molecule. We have a hormone binding to a receptor, right? That could be epinephrine, it could be growth hormone, it could be norepinephrine. Again, one of those hormones that triggers fat burning. So it binds to the receptor, stimulates those intracellular pathways I just talked about on the previous slide, and we're going to get that triglyceride broken apart into its component fatty acids. Glycerol gets released. Those fatty acids enter the blood and we have a transporter in the blood called albumin that can carry about 99% of the free fatty acids that are in the blood are bound to this albumin protein. And albumin carries the fatty acids away from the fat cells, where then the albumin can release those fatty acids through a fatty acid transporter. There you see kind of at the bottom of that picture, there's a transporter where those fatty acids are going through and they're entering a myocyte, a muscle cell. Okay. Once those fatty acids enter the myocyte, the muscle cell, they have to be activated. Then there's a transporter called L-carnitine that transports those fatty acids into the mitochondria, which again is the powerhouse of the cell. This is where we produce energy. And they undergo catabolism or breakdown in the mitochondria. So remember, each one of those fatty acids is a long carbon chain. It's a lot of carbons and hydrogens, okay? Inside the mitochondria, there's a process called beta oxidation where it's, it's a cycle that I'm not going to go through all the details, but basically what happens is that long carbon chain is chopped apart two carbons at a time. And remember, fatty acids are different lengths. Some fatty acids may be 12 carbons in length, some are 14, some are 16, some are 18. The more carbons that are in the chain, the more ATP are going to be produced, the more energy produced, okay? 
but we have to cut up those carbons two at a time. And then as the fatty acid is getting degraded, um, it eventually gets converted to a, what's called acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA enters what's called the Krebs cycle in the mitochondria, which again, talk about this in my exercise biochem class, I won't get into it here, but there's a bunch of enzymes in that Krebs cycle that converts the acetyl-CoA molecule um, into some electron carriers called NADH and FADH, and then they're fed through this thing called the respiratory chain or the electron transport chain. And um, at the end of that electron transport chain, we have oxygen waiting. And this is why we need to breathe in oxygen, because oxygen accepts the electrons from those carriers, and we eventually produce ATP, which is the energy for our cell. We need that ATP for the muscles to contract, to relax, to operate sodium potassium pumps, a variety of different things. I might also mention on this slide, I referred to... I said the Krebs cycle, that's also can be called the citric acid cycle. You see that on the screen. But I, it's, it has a variety of names, citric acid cycle, Krebs cycle. But again, this is an important part of that mitochondria where fats are broken down, these fatty acids. Okay? And then as a byproduct of this process of energy being produced, we also have carbon dioxide released, right? which that's going to be you know, diffused into the blood and will eventually um, exhale that carbon dioxide. So, I hope you have a better understanding of how fats are stored, right? Again, if you're in a caloric surplus, um, that's going to promote the storage of calories as fat, right? If, uh, you know, your insulin levels are high, that's going to tend to um, promote storage, which you see high insulin after uh, things like, you know, eating a meal. Um, if it's been a while since you ate, if you're exercising... If you have certain hormones that are active in the blood, like growth hormone, adrenaline, you know, your epinephrine, norepinephrine, cortisol, those stimulate hormone-sensitive lipase. That's the hormone in your fat cells involved in releasing and breaking down fat, okay? Also, if you're in a caloric deficit, right, you're eating less, fewer calories per day than what you need to maintain body weight, your body says, well, I'm not eating enough. I don't have enough calories coming in. I need to release stored fat and use the calories coming from that fat so that my cells can oxidize the fat, the fatty acids, and produce the energy for the body to keep functioning. Hope you enjoyed the video. See you another time.